Welcome to GreenEconomy.tv. My name is Gordon Brown, and you're joining us today for the Circular Economy Show with resident expert Chris White, director of the Circular Economy Network for Africa, and our special guest today, uh, Michael Whitehouse from RST Recycling, uh, where he's the business development and compliance manager for Africa. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Uh, today, we're speaking about e-waste, electronic waste, and it's the first of a three-part series, uh, starting with the local perspective, moving on to regional and international perspective. But to give us more insight into the topic, uh, Chris, welcome as always. Uh, please uh, give us your thoughts by way of an introduction. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gordon. Always good to be back and welcome to the viewers, uh, either live or streaming afterwards. Um, today, we're going to try and unpack some of the opportunities, issues, solutions um, around electronic waste or e-waste. Um, so let me define e-waste first of all. So e-waste is not just sort of computers and laptops and old cell phones. E-waste is basically uh, also referred to as WEEE, which is white uh, electronic and electrical and electronic equipment. So basically anything with a plug or a battery can be considered e-waste. So that would include your toaster, your kettle, your iron, uh, your dishwasher, as well as your cell phone, laptop, etc. <clears throat> now, the focus again, from our perspective, we're going to look at this over three shows. And we're going to, again, like we did with the last three shows with organic waste on a local, a regional and a global level, we're going to do the same thing with electronic waste and try and get to uh, inform and get people to understand the opportunities uh, as to where we are. So if we look at e-waste, e-waste we need to understand is one of the fastest growing waste streams globally. And South Africa is no stranger to that. So it's estimated that the e-waste volumes have increased by about 21% in the last five years. Um, and the Department of Forestry, Fishery and Environmental Affairs estimates that anywhere between 5 and 8% of our total municipal solid waste is comprised of e-waste. Now, if you want to try and put that into context, it's about 6.2 kilograms per person in this country per day. And per person means you know, whether you're just brand new born or whether you're an old granny. Um, so that would basically equate to around about 370,000 tons per year of electronic waste that's going into our landfill sites. At the moment, we estimate around about 12% is recycled in South Africa. Um, but if you look at uh, Africa, um, it's probably around about 2 million tons and the recycling rate is as low as 4%. So what is the problem with e-waste? Well, first of all, e-waste is comprised of a, a number of highly valuable materials. So in the linear economy, we tend to mine our products um, and we manufacture them into our ICT and our electronic waste. And generally, at the end of life, these things, um, we tend to go and buy the new iPhone or the, the latest laptop, and this one gets discarded. Um, and very few people know what happens to it after that. But I think it's important to note that the, the issue is around that this is classified as a hazardous material. And it's hazardous because of certain components, certain small fractions within that. We have lead, uh, mercury, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. And without appropriate management of this waste, these are released into the environment or just leached in through our landfill sites into our groundwater systems. And I think why we say there's only 12% recycling is really because um, there's a lack of awareness, there's a lack of understanding. People don't know what they should be doing with it. Um, you know, general waste is easy. You put it in a black bag, put it outside your door. But what do I do with my toaster? Um, so it's important to understand what the different opportunities are out there. So if you look at it from a local level, Cape Town, for example, has about 40,000 tons of, uh, of electronic waste entering its landfills uh, on, on an annual basis, 370,000 tons across the country. And we need people who know what they're doing to be able to manage this waste. Specifically because in October, uh, August this year, there was a landfill ban. So electronic waste is now banned from landfill. It is illegal to put any e-waste into, uh, into, into a landfill site. So how do we manage it? And that's why we have a special guest on the show today, Malcolm Whitehouse uh, from AST Recycling, an old friend and colleague. I think we've been fighting this fight for a long time, Malcolm. So great to have you on the show. Welcome. 
Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. And as always, it's, it's a pleasure uh, doing business with you. It has been uh, a number of years and we've boxed around this thing. <laughs> I don't know who, who's lost more here in the process, <laughs> you or me. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, uh, and, and Gordon, thank you very much as well for, for the opportunity. I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a burning issue and, and, it is, like Chris says, the fastest growing waste stream in the world. And I think part of the problem is is, is that awareness creation and, and education part of it, uh, coupled to a few other challenges that I'll, I'll touch based on now, uh, make it for a little bit more of a complex waste stream uh, than your normal recyclables and, and solid waste management. So um, having said that, I'd like to just introduce the company, if I may and what we're Please all about do. so that we, we, we can uh, establish where I'm coming from. So ASD Recycling was established in 2013 in South Africa, and uh, we have expanded from a very small operation back then to, to quite a, a, a formidable player in the marketplace. And in the last three years, part of my job as the compliance manager for the group was to get the company compliant to the International Standards Organization or ISO standards. And we are, I'm very pleased to say ISO 9001, ISO 14001, 27001, and 45001 certified under the Lloyd's Register. So it's a very serious certification and it, it, it obviously addresses numerous issues. And perhaps for those of you who are watching you don't know 9001 is quality systems management or quality management systems, I beg your pardon. Uh, 14001 is related to the environment. 27001 is now related to, to cyber security, which, which you, I'll touch a little bit of base on uh, later on. And then 45001 is the new occupational health and safety standard was, uh, that, that actually replaces 18001. So, so welcome. Of the, just, just, just a, to yeah. a quick question there. So, so I'm guessing these standards are what differentiates uh, the 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 correct way to recycle e-waste compared to the horrible scenes we often see in parts of Africa and India and China, yes. where you see people scrapping around and little fires burning and sort of stuff lying all over the place, right? Absolutely, and and as Chris was alluding to it. The, the earlier in the introduction was basically your, your issues are not just around the environmental health, but around human health. So mm -hmm. as, as you just mentioned, the place like Agbo Bloshi in Ghana, they reckon is the, 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 the e-waste capital of Africa. And part of the problem that we faced with this is that the modern world in the attempt to, to bridge the, the digital divide are donating tons and or container loads of, of computers to Africa in an attempt to help Africa to now cross that divide. But, you know, out of out of nine, out of 100% of, of equipment that comes in, maybe 10% is working and the rest is, 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 is non-functional, obsolete. And uh, in, in, in the industry, we call it deferred dumping. And what mm. happens is the country that, that is the beneficiary, they now sit with the problem of trying to resolve it. And uh, right. part of the standard is to, to take globally accepted best practice, and that's one of my missions in life, is, is, is to, to take the network of people that I've built over the past 11 years on globally in, in, in all the different forums and, and the ones that Chris and I have interacted on so many times before, to, to, to take those uh, compliance issues and standards and massage them into an African, I call it Africa-centric uh, methodology because a lot of the European or Eurocentric type of standards just don't work. Yeah, you know, this mm -hmm. is Africa after all, and things are done differently. There's a different mindset, etc. So, so we take that and we 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 use the, the ISO standards because they're internationally accepted by a lot of our clients. Our client base is very often multinational in terms of 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 their spread across the world, and they have the same problem. It doesn't matter where they are but a little bit of that just now. So just to get back to who we are. So we've yes, grown please. into the company that's certified. We have a presence in South Africa. 
in Johannesburg. We've opened in the Western Cape, in Cape Town. We're busy opening in Durban next week. Uh, Chris, so I'll be visiting you again soon. <laughs> and uh, we're also looking at, at PE and, and in Pumalanga. We then have branches in Botswana, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, and Nigeria. I was recently in the DRC, so we're looking at the DRC and in and Kenya as well, with the, the sort of the Madagascan, Mauritian uh, islands, the Indian Ocean islands. We've also had quite a lot of inquiries coming out of there. And there's a need for, for Africa-centric solutions to the problem because to put it into a little bit of perspective, as much as it's the fastest growing waste stream, there's a thing called EPR or extended producer responsibility. So all the producers that are manufacturing and placing devices on market are actually uh, bound legally to look after that device from cradle to cra cradle now, not cradle to grave anymore because that was uh, the linear economy and we're now transitioning into a circular economy. What do we mean by the circular economy? For those who don't know, it's, it's literally preventing the mining of raw materials and, and the depletion of finite resources and taking what can be found within the, the devices that we manage and recovering what we call secondary resource materials. And or we could, we, another term for it, which I see has become quite popular is urban mining. And I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that uh, now. So typically you'll find in the multinational scenario that they will go in country and say, okay, we need to recycle. And they've got these very stringent standards and no one can comply to it because that's, that's an issue. They don't have the compliance. They don't have the standards. It's extremely costly as well. So we say, okay, let's see what we can do to, to give you the standards. And or in terms of our enterprise development, let's see what we can do to have a set of norms and standards based on the, the, the global standards that are related to our industry and work from there and uh, give them that opportunity, which they generally accept because they'll accept what's best practice in country or what's available in country. To get back to the South African context from a, from a legislation point of view, there's a very big challenge around the legislation governing our sector because it's very generic, generic and with an approach, a risk averse approach, it makes life a little bit complicated because it's, it's, it's a standard sort of interpretation of e-waste is hazardous because of, as Chris, Chris mentioned earlier, the intrinsic uh, ingredients or, or, or products found within your beryllium's, your cadmiums, your mercury's, your lead and, and, and all the rest of it, which are dangerous materials. But as we manage the stuff, just moving it around from the consumer or the, the, the end user to finally bring it in here for either repurposing, refurbishment or recycling, we, we find that, that that legislation makes life very complicated. So we've been boxing with this quite, quite a lot backwards and forwards and we've got to a point where they now have uh, the EPR legislation is in place and they have two industry product responsibility organizations that are in play and all producers, all recyclers, all refurbishers, all have to be registered with those PROs in terms of, of actually uh, managing the business and trying to get the playing field level. So your, your question earlier on was quite pertinent in terms of getting to the standard because what's happening, ASD would be, or, and, and our competitors that are on, on the same level will have gone to a lot of expense to get all of the certification, but the guys, that are running out of their backyards and stuff. They're still approaching corporates, they're buying devices, and they will then take the devices back to their facility or wherever they operate from. They will do what we call cherry picking. In, in other words, pick out the very valuable fractions and end up dumping the rest. So it doesn't exonerate the client that sold the devices to this person from being responsible for the final recycling thereof. And, and that's, that's some of the issues that, that a lot of people are not aware, aware of, especially from a, uh, an education and awareness point, point of view. So that particular act that, that, that is, is called the National Environmental Management Waste Act, it to the fact that 
when you have used your device at the end of life and you no longer have need for it, you have to have it recycled responsibly at your own cost. And uh, it doesn't mean because you've sold it to a recycler that you are now exonerated from that, obli or that obligation. You need to know what the person is doing. And hence the fact that we're trying to educate the consumers to understand that when they do use a recycler, they must check their credentials and make sure that that they are who they say they are and that they can do what they say they can do in terms of, of, of ensuring that they meet their obligations. And through our standards, we actually help our clients to meet those legal obligations. Over and above chain of custody documentation, over and above the fact that they can come and check what we're doing at any time and be part of, of, of sort of uh, uh, destruction of certain data uh, physical destruction or whatever methods we use. So, so that I think just in a nutshell wraps up what we're doing. So, if you if you if you'd like to perhaps pose one or two questions at this point, Chris, uh, please yeah. feel free to do that. Just what I want to try and do, I think, Malcolm, is is to contextualize the issue. And again, we brought you on from a a local perspective. Um, you know, understanding that you are regional and hopefully global very soon. Um, but the issue is 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 right at the ground. So the first thing is, is, is that people need to know that they have a commitment, that they have a yeah. responsibility, whether they are an individual uh, from the, 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 the housewife, the, 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 the work at home parents, uh, the children with all of their, all of their electronic toys. Um, they need to get it to a responsible person. But we have several issues. One is how do we, how do we know where the waste is? How do we access that waste? How do we move that waste and collect that waste and get it into a certified or a compliant recycling center? So how does somebody know that, that they are working with a compliant person versus somebody who's just offering them 20 bucks for the computer and they're gonna strip it and, and, uh, and, and cherry pick from it? But then there's a process. So the process is that we need to move that to a center. We need to be able to look at assessing what waste there is. We need to measure it. Uh, we then need to look at opportunities around refurbishment. Uh, then we look at the recycling and the dismantling, uh, harvesting, which is another component to look at, at key components that can be reused, like hard drives or motherboards or memory. Um, and then the recycling, which is the, the, the next stage to that, where we then look at the extraction of the, the particular components. So maybe what we can do is, uh, I know that we've got uh, Katu from, from AST who's out there uh, wandering around the facility, but also maybe we can go through and have a look at what that process is. And uh, so Katu is uh, has cut in there. She's our roving reporter at the moment. And uh, this is one of the processing facilities for AST. And uh, essentially what we need to look at is uh, is all the different processes and steps there. And perhaps uh, Katu and, and uh, Gordon, you, uh, uh, Malcolm, you can drive us through what's going on there. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. So, so Basically, the, the first part of the process is to engage with the client, is, uh, get organized in terms of collection. So we go out and we collect from our clients. We also buy back from uh, buyback centers that act as collection points. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of alluding to your project in, in, in KZN, Lemby, Chris. So, so there are various setups all over the place, and we do... Uh, ensure that we have a, a market for the, the informal collection footprint. So Katu, can you just go uh, perhaps closer to, to one of the, the, the people so we can just show them what we're doing. So once the stuff comes in, and this is now a particularly viable equipment for recycling, it's not, uh, not viable for, for refurbishment, so we're only recycling. So you'll see there each, each person has got their tools, they've got the the personal protective equipment on. They've been trained fully to do what they're doing. So there, the gentleman is busy uh, undoing. I can't quite see what the, the, the device is, but he's the busy dismantling. Katu, can you move around the, the bench for us a little bit? So typically what we do here, each item will be dismantled into the following fractions. It will be steel. So there you can see uh, can we just drop that one a little bit so you can see the actual board? Yes, more, a little bit more there. So he's busy taking, uh, it looks like a, a part of out of a server, and he will then take the, the strip it into PC boards, into steel, into plastic, 
into cables, and then also if there's uh, monitors and glass that will all be separated. So they might just take the individual components out there, and then they'll have the, 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 the bins in front of them. So there's bins full of cable. The next bin's got boards in it. Those are all mixed boards. The next lot is, is some uh, steel. And I think the last one might, may also be a little bit of steel there. So each, each person is dismantling into those fractions, which then, once they are dismantled, we then go through and do finite sorting. And the components are all sold to specialist downstream vendors specifically that do the recycling. So the steel guys will take the steel and recycling. There's a whole lot of, it looks like, uh, telephones that have come in. So they will strip them into the plastics and stuff. The plastics will be sold off to a specialist plastics vendor downstream to be recycled and new uh, products are made out of that. The PC board specifically, because there's no technology in South Africa that is geared commercially for the recovery of, of the components that we are looking for, we ship these, once we've sorted them into different grading, we ship those to the, the refineries in Europe, the specialist European refineries that manage PC boards. And out of the boards, we would extract precious metals like gold, silver, palladium, and copper. There is a little bit of tin, so some of the technologies are developing and you're starting to get tin out of it as well. But then all the other, the ferrous, your steel uh, products go to the steel guys, and then the non-ferrous, your, your aluminium and brass and, and that type of stuff. Uh, goes to the local uh, re recyclers in South Africa. So we keep as much as we can local. In terms Welcome, of... Welcome, uh, just um, uh, if I can just jump in there. I mean, it's uh, yeah. thanks Thanks for showing us what, what, what you guys are doing there in the sorting room. I mean, it's it's incredibly labor intensive and, and, and actually, you know, I say a semi-skilled job at the very least uh, to understand mm -hmm. what you're doing using multiple tools and so forth and, and sorting these things accordingly. Uh, what, what is happening? I mean, from your experience on the ground as the running the guys that are dismantling, to what extent is the industry innovating in respect of the uh, uh, design for dismantling? I mean, is it getting harder or easier to dismantle things? And talk us through some of the challenges like merged or fused uh, materials or tricky components or badly designed components that make your life difficult. And what would you like to see change just to make this whole exercise that much easier? Thanks, Gordon. So, so, so it's a good question that because, first of all, I'd like to touch on the manual labor side of it. In our industry, we find that that from an African perspective or even a South African perspective, let's keep it local, it is probably one of the best ways of job creation that is out there because the, the, the sustainable income that can be made out of being part of this is, is very good, number one. And you don't need that extremely high level of, of, of skill. We, we In fact, I'm, I'm in a work group that's currently developing a curriculum, national curriculum for e-waste uh, specific jobs, your collector, your sorter, your dismantler, and the refurbisher. And uh, it lends itself to that. And, and the second part of the manual labor that we have a very uh, big advantage over the European way of doing things is that we have far better finite sorting, which gives us a far better cleaner fraction, which gives a far better yield in terms of the actual, the steel or the copper or the whatever is being recovered. So, so from that perspective, the, the, valor, the valorization is very good because we are now going through to, uh, we, we, we can pass that value down the value chain in terms of the collection, which facilitates the cleaning up of the, of, of the, of the environment, et cetera. So that is the one part of it. Mechanized recycling is, is quite an issue because you have a lot of cross-contamination. Uh, the stuff is going through shredders, so, so different fractions are, are being infused into one another. And if I can give you my sort of perception of it, they may have a 70% uh, recovery rate of all secondary resource materials out of mechanized recovery, and then still have to go through a lot of other pretreatment to try and do more finite sorting, 
where we are, as we sit here, we're recovering up to 98% of everything found within a device through manual sorting thing. We would like to see a lot more uh, design for recycling, which is a challenge. Our big challenge is, is and remain CRT monitors, the old cathode ray tube monitors, because they have lead, uh, barium and strontium and phosphorescence in them. But a lot of that stuff is encapsulated in the glass in the form of oxide because it has that to protect you from radiation disease as a user. And, and it's quite complicated to recycle that. There's a lot of valuable stuff in there, but, but that particular glass is hollow glass and it cannot be used for, like, if you take the oxides out, you have clear glass, but there's not, really, there's not a lot you can do with it. So those are technologies that we need to find solutions for. But again, it, it boils down to the critical mass issue, your cost of technology versus your, your recovery of investment. Uh, and, and then also your feedstock. You only have a limited amount of feedstock. And for that purpose, we use hazardous landfill sites for, for those types of fractions at this point in time. But very often our clients expect us to do the, the service free of charge, but that is a service that we have to pay the hazardous landfill site for because they, they, they're treating it in a cell and they're putting lime into it and they're doing what they do with it. If that answers your question, Gordon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, over to you, Chris. I think you may be on mute. <laughs> Sorry, a little more birds in the background chirping away. So the, the idea really is that we need to look at designing for recyclability. Um, we are seeing moves afoot um, through, a, through the new Green Deal in Europe to look at specifically um, upgradable components, um, looking at, uh, at things like cell phones as a service as opposed to as a, um, a, a, as a component that you buy. Um, and that starts to bring forward the opportunity for those manufacturers then to look at clip and play upgrades um, for camera components, uh, hard drive components, um, processor components. That's going to extend the life of these different um, electronic waste, uh, particularly in the ICT sector. There's also a lot of move in the white waste sector, your fridges, stoves, etc., to move into a into a rental type model where instead of buying the equipment, you actually rent it uh, for its usage. And that works out, uh, means that the consumer doesn't have that big capital expenditure up front. Um, but it also means that the, the manufacturer is going to make sure that fridge lasts for 25 years and not for two years. So that's a drive towards the circular economy. Um, also more robust materials so that when they do reach end of life, they're easier to recycle and bring back into the system. And these are all uh, systems that are developing um, as the world moves towards a, a circular economy. We still have a long way to go uh, in Africa. We're trailing significantly behind um, uh, behind the, the rest of the world. But a lot of our OEMs or, or original equipment manufacturers and our IT brands are all global brands. So they are required to comply with international standards. The issue is really, um, you know, from, from Malcolm and, and my perspective, is the education side of things. How do we get that e equipment out of there? How do we move from 12% recycling to 100% recycling? How do we educate people that you can't throw a light bulb or a CFL bulb into a, uh, into a black bag because it has mercury poisoning in it? Um, you can't throw away your component or hand it down to, to your gardener, um, you know, for them to smash it to pieces and strip out um, you know, half a kilogram of copper and then dump everything else back into, into the environment. So that education is a key component that we need to start driving forward. The people understand it's got to go through the right processes. Um, Malcolm, myself, and a number of, of uh, stakeholders in, in the industry are looking at developing norms and standards and applications to do that. Um, but also to, to work with the legislators to understand where there are restrictions in terms of the blockages that, that, that open up recycling. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, which is why Malcolm and I have no hair. Um, and I mean, this is just one thing that we're looking at here. So there, there's, there's a lot of different applications and components to it. But to get to 100% recycling, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, we also need to focus on the local beneficiation, which Malcolm said is a problem. So we don't have 
local refining systems, um, but we are developing those. Those are part of the process that we're working in to look at localized um, beneficiation or extraction of those precious metals so that we don't have to export anymore to Japan and Canada, uh, or, or there's a, a, the European one as well. But the opportunity then to look at adding as much value as you can locally, um, but then also to understand the import of materials into Africa and the impact of that. So there's a long way to go, Gordon. Um, Malcolm knows this only too well. Um, and that's also what they're seeing is that people are stepping onto that. So um, yeah, the countries are opening up, they're asking questions, they want to be compliant, they want to show how they can drive in with this network. And we need companies like uh, like ASD to, um, to drive this. Um, so good luck to Malcolm and ASD Recycling. I think uh, it, it's been... Uh, it's been a long journey, Malcolm, and one that we continue to, to do. And I'm looking forward to having you back in in, uh, in Surfland next week when you come through. Yeah. And we'll go and catch a cold one and talk about glass recycling for a change. That, uh, what a pleasure. Um, just, um, so, uh, perhaps just, just in closing, um, I mean, we're talking about the consumer and the practical realities. Uh, let's just chat briefly about uh, the role of the municipality in collecting recyclables. So, um, and, and so if you have a recycler, so here at, at my address here in Cape Town, there's a company that comes along and picks up the recycling. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I can put my, my uh, uh, electrical waste in there along with other waste which is separated. I don't, we don't separate everything. We put all, all the recyclables into a single bag and then you give it to the recycler and off they go. And, and one hopes that they, they're going to treat that responsibly. At the same time, I might give a device to, let's say, a domestic worker, um, and then that person's going to go to wherever she lives. In my instance, she might live in Hart Bay. What is the city doing? It's one thing to say, well, no, no electronic waste to landfall, but what are they actually doing uh, to sort out uh, the waste as it flows down the channels and to, and to extract these uh, uh, these e-waste items. Perhaps just a, uh, in conclusion, as we wrap up the conversation, let's perhaps just give us some more insight in, into how viewers can can perhaps manage or play their role in trying to uh, get this stuff into circulation. Okay. Um, Chris, would you like to say a comment? Or? No, I, I mean, it, it's uh, you, you know it as well as I do. You go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, that is a very good question, uh, Gordon. So part of the challenge that we face is to integrate the informal collector uh, in Cape Town, in the Western Cape, they call them waste wastepreneurs, uh, wastepreneurs or whatever, that's quite a fancy word. But it's the informal guys that are pushing the trolleys and they're picking up uh, the, the, uh, the devices. As you say, you can literally put anything out on the sidewalk and someone will pick it up. And they know what the value is. The people are, are getting to understand that there's value in this. The trick is to get them educated, first of all, through the forums that we work with and, and, and the Waste Pickers Association of South Africa and some of the others, so we can train these people and, and equip them. But there are a couple of challenges that we're alluding to in terms of transport because they need to understand this is supposed to be, it's defined as a hazardous waste. So it's a challenge. How do you get past a guy pushing a trolley with, with some of the stuff that is collected from your sidewalk and he doesn't know that this is hazardous waste. And he then strips the thing and, and he only takes the, the main component and uh, uh, and sells it back to ASD for that matter and he dumps the rest. So, so there's an education process required there. 75% uh, if, uh, interestingly enough of all e-waste resides within our own households. You go and pull a drawer open, you'll find 10 cell phones, three tablets, two old computers uh, being used as a doorstop, et cetera. So, so, so that's where the bulk of the equipment lies. Uh, and people think it's, it's the, uh, you know, the governments and corporates that are using all of it. Yes, they do use big volumes, but 75% resides in our homes. So we need to educate the general public as well. What we're doing as a company, we're embarking on a project where we're placing bins at strategic points. We find that 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 uh, secure estates are very uh, into all types of recycling projects to offer to the residents. 
And then also we're looking at, at put placing bins at shopping centers where where they have a section where they can take all types of recyclables in. And it works very well because now uh, Joe Smith gets up in the morning, he puts in his cardboard, paper, glass, tin, and his e-waste into the back of the car, and he puts a family in the car, and off they go to the shopping mall. He drops them off, goes around, gives in all the recyclables, goes, does the shopping, and they go on one trip, no issue. Whereas currently it's been an issue, you've got to go there for paper and another direction for glass, etc. So, So that's important. The other thing is that we try to get uh, the um, the retailers to understand that under the Consumer Protection Act, Section 59 of the Act specifically stipulates if you sell a device to a consumer, you are obliged to take that device back at the end of its life cycle or at, at the end of its useful life to the consumer or whether they're trading it in on a new one or not. But then you need to have it recycled formally through a responsible and accredited recycler at your cost, free of charge to the consumer. So those are the types of things that we need to start embarking on to create that awareness. And 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 we did some projects in some of the other companies that I worked in where we, we had this type of thing. You may have seen there's bins in macro stores, for instance. So the idea is to 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 have more drop-off points where people can put the stuff. But the challenge remains again the security around this. You go and place your stuff in there, and some guy jumps in the bin and pulls it out, runs over the road, strips the, the valuable stuff, and 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 dumps the rest. So so I think that the education and awareness creation is really a massive drive. Uh, personally, I feel something like the Arrive Alive campaign that is driven by government is a type of campaign that should be embarked on by government with the industry feeding the, the information back to them. So, you know, that, that I see is one of the, the positives going forward. And like Chris says, you know, we, 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 we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us, but I believe we are we, we're on the right track and we just need to, to go um, in terms of, of, of just keeping at it and, and, and the dynamics keep on changing, but I, I think the, the idea is there to, to get the thing done more formally and to try and get the, the, the level playing fields in play as well. No, what a pleasure. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, folks. That's all that, uh, the time we have, have today. I'd just like to extend a huge well, uh, thank you to Malcolm Whitehouse uh, from AST and also to his colleague, uh, uh, Katu Papio, who's uh, showed us the, some, some cool uh, images there from, from, the, from the sorting room. Thanks all also to Chris White, as always. And then, ladies and gentlemen, join us again next week, 1 o'clock Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be talking about e-waste at a regional scale and a regional context. And um, we have a fantastic uh, guest for you uh, uh, next week. We have, uh, um, let's quickly get it up on screen here. We have Susan Karcher from the WRF and the SRI. That's the World Resources Forum and the Sustainable Recycling Industries. So be there next week, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock. We'll see you then. Before you go, we're going to play out with a video from AST. Please stay on, on, online and check it out. Thank you very much. Goodbye for me. Bye-bye, Gordon. Electronic waste is the, is the fastest growing waste stream in the world. In Africa, I believe the total is somewhere around 2 million tons a year, of which only 4% roughly is being recycled. Most outdated computers and electronic equipment reaching end of life ends up in landfills, where it not only contributes to the untenable waste prices, but heavy metals from the components leach into the earth and pollute the water table. And as a growing desire for electronics continues to balloon, so does the need for correct end-of-life disposal. AST Recycling is a leader in the management of electronic waste, offering clients a full turnkey solution with IT asset management and IT asset disposal. AST's e-waste management includes consultation, needs analysis, collection of e-waste, sorting, assessment for refurbishment, data sanitization and dismantling then diverting e-waste from landfill through a recycling program. The components that can't be refurbished are then recycled. We sell the fractions off to them so they generate the revenue for us and that enables us to give the service to the clients generally free of charge. The recycling part of the AST business provides job opportunities and income generation for individuals in the informal sector. 
At the AST Buyback Center, e-waste can be brought in for recycling. Together with clients and partners, AST has diverted almost 60,000 tons of waste from landfill across South Africa and have created similar ventures in other African countries. AST's presence is strong in five African countries, South Africa, Nigeria, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, with branches planned for many others, including Lesotho, Swaziland, and Mozambique. We've been very successful in our ventures in Africa this far, and we trust that we're going to grow our business and in so doing help to facilitate e-waste management throughout the continent in time to come.